Hi, welcome to the Interaxis YouTube channel, Interaxis.io. We're going to keep talking about lending and debt and such in, in several of these videos. And we're going to hit a topic that we've actually hit probably a few times in different videos and, and talks. And this is the pooled lending that's happening in DeFi and decentralized finance. Now, much of this, of course, is happening on uh, Ethereum. That's actually the, the chain that, that is seeing almost all of the DeFi action. But what we're seeing is there's more and more of these applications. They've kind of been proven on Ethereum, and now they're being potentially pushed to other, change, other chains, like a, a Tezos is, is having some DeFi applications on them now, partially because people are hosting uh, their, or, or custodying or using Tezos as the, the chain of choice for several security tokens. So what is pooled lending? So if you remember, we need to go back a little bit uh, to our uh, usual example of the, the Adam and Ron, right, where Adam has money. So Adam has his $100,000 Ron needs to borrow for his business. And uh, of course, we could have this situation where Adam directly lends money to Ron and they have some sort of agreement, or typically there's some sort of intermediary in here, which, which might be a bank, right? Usually we call this the bank. Adam puts money in here, and the promise I get in return is some level of interest. I have no uh, idea what the bank is doing with that money on this side. It's not my job, right? It, it, because my money coming back is not that does not hinge on the fact that the bank is lending out money to Ron. I don't really care. All I know is I want to put my money in and be able to, to get it out. But the bank's job is to make money. And the way they make money is they take my money in, they lend it out here, and they make some higher interest rates. So if they're paying me 1%, they charge Ron 6%, and they get to keep the difference. And what they get to do, what, what the reason why they're keeping that difference is they are underwriting. They're making sure, of course, that Ron uh, is credit worthy and they might be getting some sort of collateral. So uh, the collateral is a, is a big part that, of course, we've talked about in another video about using crypto assets as collateral. So Ron has some sort of collateral that he offers. He has some sort of business plan, hopefully some reason why he's borrowing the money. And the bank has decided he's a good credit risk. Um, or, or whatever company is, has decided he's a good credit risk and therefore they are, they are going to lend him the money, they're going to get the interest. I get paid my 1%. I just have to hope that all of these people that they lend money to continue to, to pay back the loans, in which case the bank can, may, I make sure that I have my money and I'm getting paid my interest. Of course, in the U.S. with the Federal uh, Deposit Insurance Corporation, up to you know, $250,000 of my money is actually insured by the federal government. So even if the bank runs out of money, if all these people don't pay back, I will still get my, my money up to an amount. Therefore, I say all that to tell you this, the point of DeFi lending, of the pooled DeFi lending, is to take the bank out of the equation to, to basically be able to pass on these fees. But how, do we, how are we able to do that? Well, we have to figure out, going back to last week, talking about incentive structure, we have to figure out the incentive structure. And, and we have to break this down and say, okay, wh what really is the bank? The bank is one party putting money in and another party borrowing. So can we take this bank and change this essentially to some sort of code, some sort of program that we've written? And this is what's happened. So you see Compound and, and BZX and DYDX and Aave and other, and other protocols out there that have said, look, we will write this protocol. And what this is going to have in here is some, uh, essentially some algorithms that say, you put in your cryptocurrency here. So in this case, maybe it's DAI. And this algorithm is going to determine, OK, we need to have a certain amount of cryptocurrency uh, of DAI coming in one side so that we can lend it out. And at all times, it's going to be looking at what's the demand from this side? What do people want to borrow? OK, do they, do they want to borrow DAI? Yes, they do. OK, what are they willing to put up as collateral? Well, they, they you know, potentially put up ETH as collateral. So if I want to put my ETH in, if Ron wants to put ETH in the, the, will offer up his ETH as collateral, he can borrow DAI, and it might be you know, two to one, something like that, the, the collateral ratio. So this algorithm is always adjusting this interest rate and this interest rate, because it's having to, to, in, to create incentives on both sides. It's got to give me the incentive to put my money into the protocol to lock it in this smart contract. And it's got to give Ron the incentive to actually borrow, to put up his ETH as collateral and borrow money. If Ron think 
thinks ETH is going to go up in value by 20%, he's probably willing to pay 6 or, or even 12% to borrow money because, because he thinks ETH is going to go up 20, right? So if he, if he borrows and ETH is worth $200 and he thinks it's going to go up to 220 and he can borrow money and, and only pay $12 in interest, he makes out with, with $8, right? That's a, a good financial incentive. So this algorithm is always looking at, at actual supply and demand. How many people are demanding loans? What are they providing as collateral? How many people, um, and because of that, how, many, how much liquidity do we need? How many people do we need to put their money, their die, into this smart contract to be able to satisfy this demand? Okay, for people to put money in this smart contract, we might have to raise the interest rate. The interest rate has to go up to 1% or 2% or 3%, and this is constantly adjusting. So the rates on all the DeFi lending protocols, for the most part, are always adjusting because they're trying to keep supply and demand in line here, supply and demand in line here. Okay, the other thing they're doing, as I mentioned, collateral. Right, so Ron is putting up this ETH as collateral. So what they have to watch out for, and, and the reason why this is such a big deal, and, and we really have to look at this, is the, is the volatility of cryptocurrency assets. The volatility of crypto has made it to where they have to have such high collateralization ratios. So it might be two to one. So if ETH is worth $200 and Ron puts one in, he can only take 100 die out as a loan. Right, that's very important because it means that he has to lock up twice as much. So again, when I said if, if Ron thinks this is going to go up $20 and he borrows, uh, he can only borrow $100,000, is, is he willing to do that? Okay, now his, his interest rate might be relatively low, but is he willing to lock up his money and have that level of collateralization? Is he better off selling his ETH at that point? Is he better off selling it? Uh, if, if he doesn't think the value is going to go up that much, he can just sell a hundred die worth of ETH, get his hundred die, and still have a hundred ETH, and not have to pay any interest for that. So if he thinks the value of ETH isn't going to go up that much, then he might just sell it and take his money that way if he needs it. Okay, so the collateralization is really important. Now the algorithms have also been built, right? Because the idea is for this to be as decentralized as possible. You just throw it out there on the network and let it run. So how does the collateralization work? Well, if this is a collateralization ratio, again, if it's two to one, if, it's, if Ron put in $200 worth of ETH and got to borrow 100 die, and the, and the ratios, the algorithms might say, if this gets below uh, 150. If the value gets below 150, we're going to liquidate. What happens is they're they're watching this, and there's of course an oracle that's that's guiding this price. It's telling Compound or telling BZX or telling whatever this protocol is. There's an oracle telling it what the price of ETH is at that moment, and that's why again the oracles are so important. And we've talked about those in other videos, and we'll talk about them in others. Why the oracles are so important right now, because the oracle is informing this algorithm as to what the, the price is this particular time at any particular time. If it falls below 150, what it says is is okay, now we're gonna take this ETH from Ron. He no longer can take it back. Okay, we're gonna take the ETH from Ron, which is worth 150, and, and we're gonna potentially hold it in our protocol, sell it, whatever we need to do, and uh, and, and Ron now, you know, has, has to pay back the die. Okay, so he he's been he's given up his collateral at that point because it's fallen below a certain ratio, because this protocol was written, especially when when cryptocurrency values were so volatile. Now that they've kind of stabilized a little bit, but we still have that level of volatility, that that lack of comfort because of the fact that the oracles are still not foolproof, because there still can be so much manipulation in the value of, of cryptocurrency. And if it falls, you know, even for several seconds or, or a minute or so, if it falls to a certain level, or we've seen it where it falls in, in one uh, block, in, in the period of one Ethereum block, the price falls enough it can drive all sorts of havoc, right? It can create all sorts of havoc in, in the lending world, in the collateralization world and all, because when the values hit a certain point, this code, this protocol, is, it's not 
people running it. It's a protocol, and all it says is if the value according to this oracle falls below a certain amount, we're going to liquidate. We're going to take your collateral. Um, you, you can keep your 100 die, but we're taking your $150 worth of ETH at that point. Okay, so that's a little bit about how these run. Now, what, what also happens is I, in return for my 100 die or 200 die, whatever I put in, I, in this case, get, get tokens. Right, so I get tokens essentially that represent my my uh, ownership or my liquidity that I've provided to the protocol, and these tokens can you know consistently kind of go up in value as the interest is generated. So when I the the nice part about this is this is how the protocol is keeping track. Right, they issue new tokens. So on Compound, for instance, I get C die, which is worth. Uh, so, you know, every one is worth a certain amount of die, and, and, I, and, and I have these tokens, and I can then send them to someone else. So the really cool part now is if I have, in this case, my C die tokens, I can send them to someone else, and that person is now essentially, it's like they've provided liquidity to the protocol. They continue to get interest. So I can, in theory, deposit a whole bunch of money in here and then send those CDI tokens to a friend or family member or whatever, and it's like I sent them a savings account. Okay, it's like I, I sent them money that's already earning interest. They don't have to do anything else. I might send it to my family in another country. I might send it to my child. Whatever it might be, I can send them tokens. I can send them money that's already earning other money. It's already earning interest. Uh, we haven't really seen that much before, except you, you know, you, you, uh, I grew up, I got bonds as a gift. I got US savings bonds. And basically what did, someone did is they bought a whole bunch of savings bonds that matured on a certain date. And at that date, I could send them into the government or take them to the bank and they would give me cash for them. You know, the government says, here's exactly what they're worth at this date. This is kind of like that, except I can you know, put money into account, send tokens wherever I want, and those tokens are already accumulating interest. So uh, as far as the protocols go, we're, I, I don't, I, I'm not necessarily going to go into a tremendous amount of detail on all the different protocols, partially because they change so quickly and they, and they grow so quickly. Um, but we, we've kind of seen them go through maturity stages and, and immaturity stages, um, but they've, they've had to be built up to where you know, the collateralization ratio started off relatively high, and there are people trying to create um, lower collateralization lending going on. There, is, um, there are ways like Ray from, from Staked, which we've talked about before, that will actually take your money in here. So we, we talked about Ray, and they will look across the different uh, the, the different lending protocols, for instance, and they will continue to put your money in whichever one is making the most interest at the time. So if Compound is paying 3% and these are paying 2 your money will be here. And then if at some point Compound goes to 2 and this goes to 4 and 3 they'll take your money out of here and, and put it in there. So because of the composability, because again of those, of those tokens that are representing my liquidity in the lending protocol, now we have this composability on top of it. We have the fact that, I, that, that someone can build a, a system like Ray that actually pulls my, puts my money in and takes it out relatively quickly, and my money is locked in this smart contract. Okay, this is tremendously powerful and something is overlooked is the composability of actual lending protocols. So we've also seen the advent, you know, especially through Ave of the flash loan. And, and uh, the, you know, the, the flash loan being one where the, the loan, so I'm borrowing funds, but I'm borrowing it for one block, one transaction period. Now, because of composability, again, I can structure so many different transactions to happen in that block. So I could potentially borrow, uh, provide liquidity, um, do a uh, trade, take back my liquidity, and repay, and I can structure that to all happen in one block, right? So I can actually, you know, potentially make money if I see an arbitrage opportunity. If I see a time where a token is trading for, uh, you know, 50 die on one exchange and 35 on another, I can arbitrage that and I can actually borrow money to do it and put that money back all in one transaction and it's like, it, it's really like it never happened except I end up with more money.
Like that, that's what happened. I borrowed money and I paid it back almost right away. But in the meantime, I did all these things and I came, came back with money. That happened in, 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 with, with flash loans with Aave. Now we're seeing, some, now we're seeing governance tokens uh, for the, the lending protocols. Um, which is giving people the ability to own that token and actually contribute to the governance of that protocol to, to decide what will happen. Um, we're again seeing the protocols, the, the composability, the ability to take those interest earning tokens and, uh, and, and send them around or put them on or stack them on top of other protocols or stack them on top of, on top of other applications. Um, so we, they're tremendously powerful and, and as we've said, the lending is so much more important than actual equity in, in just the world economy, right? Lending is four to five times the size of the equity markets worldwide. So lending from a decentralized perspective is going to be so much larger and so much more important. It's almost the, the main impetus of decentralized finance. It's that relationship, right? That, that trustless relationship we can have. The, the, the most basic one, again, is Adam has money, Ron needs money, and I lend him money. Right? That's the most basic transaction. And what we've tried to do with decentralized finance is connect the people who have it and want to lend it and earn interest with the people who need it and want to borrow it. And the rest of it is just semantics. Right? The, the rest of it is just how you're going to do that. Well, there's a lot of semantics. And what decentralized finance is, is potentially able to give us is the ability to scale this relationship without having too many intermediaries, right? It makes this relate, the ability of this relationship to, to, be, to, to be international, to be the fact that we don't have to trust each other. We don't have to know each other because the code is gonna take care of it. It can be the fact that this, this loan might be $30, right? And he might really need it and I can really let him borrow it and he could be anywhere in the world where the, a transaction like that with real dollars going from bank to bank to bank is prohibitively expensive and time consuming for someone to borrow $30 from halfway around the world. However, if we can do it in die in a single transaction and do it you know, almost immediately and do it in a way where I know he's gonna pay me back because he's put up $50 worth of collateral, then why wouldn't I take that all day? Right, it would be really easy. Why wouldn't he do that all day? Borrow you know, small bits of money here and there uh, as he needs it because the cost is so far down. So pooled lending is, is so big because then we can take the pools and create other pools and other pools and other pools and it sounds like this rehypothecation, this idea of lending money on top of money. But what it really is from the composability standpoint is the fact that there can be a whole bunch of, of RONs in here borrowing money, I can lend here and this can be distributed and then eventually Right? This is basically a portfolio of loans, and all of these have their separate characteristics, and we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in another video, but then I can potentially sell this pool of loans, because now this is earning income, right? It's an asset that earns income, that's all it is. And I've potentially figured out a way to do this. So, that is a bit about pooled lending in, in DeFi. We're gonna talk about so many more lending topics. It's so exciting what's going on, but that is a bit about pooled lending. Again, we didn't go into too much detail on all the different protocols that are out there, partially because they change so quickly, it'd be really hard to, to continue to do these videos, and partially because uh, we can go into detail and they can go into detail on all the protocols at, at another time. But right now we wanna talk about DeFi pooled lending and how important it is and how exciting it is. Hope you enjoyed this. Please subscribe. If you have comments, please write them down below and, and we really try to reply to all those if, if there's any questions. Uh, find our, our email address, info at interaxis.io, Twitter at interaxis8. Let us know what you think uh, and we hope to see you in the next video.